Hello and good morning, CSI 257 students for the fall 2014 semester at Anne Arundel Community College. This is the third of four networking courses. This is the Scaling Networks course that's part of the Cisco Networking Academy. And today's tutorial is going to be on Packet Tracer Activity 6.2.3.6, where we're going to be configuring multi area OSPF. And as you can see here, this has been nicely color coded for you. So you can see we have area 0 as well as area one and area two. All right, we've got our addressing table here and we're gonna go ahead and configure multi-area OSPF v2. So it's gonna be IPv4 and the network's already connected and the interface is already configured with their addressing. So what we're gonna be doing is enabling multi-area OSPF and then we're gonna verify connectivity and examine the operation of multi-area OSPF v2. So let's go ahead and jump in. So the first thing that it asks us to do is to configure OSPF v2 on router 1. It gives us the process ID information. I'll bring this down a little bit here. It gives us the process ID information to use as well as the router ID. And we're going to go ahead and start now from user exec mode. We're going to move into privilege exec mode and then into global config. So we'll configure the router OSPF 1 right using process ID 1 remembering that that process ID does not have to be the same on the routers where you're going to establish an adjacency. So that is a locally significant value, the router or the process ID here, which again is much different from EIGRP, which you're going to see in the upcoming chapters. So process ID 1. We're going to go ahead and assign the router ID as 1.1.1.1. And so then we want to advertise each directly connected network in OSPF v2 on router 1. And so the commands are actually provided here for us. So if I were to do a do show IP interfaces brief, you can see that we've got 10.1.1.0, and then 192.168.10. And so we're going to go ahead and type in network. 10.1.1.0.0.0.255 area 1 and so what we're saying here on router 1 is these interfaces that are in this area right these networks 10.1.1.0 and 10.1.2.0 that the interfaces with those IP addresses that are in those subnets will be participating in area 1 of OSPF and so then we're also going to say network 10.1.2.0.0.0.255 and this is going to be area 1 as well and you can see there that the other area 1 devices that are out there in the cloud we've established adjacency with one and now we should see the exact same thing happen here on the other interface where we've got an adjacency established with the router with the router ID 5.5.5.5 and so here's how you can tell which router you're establishing an adjacency with this is the router ID again it looks like an IP address but remember that is not an IP address that is the router ID okay so those two adjacencies are currently up let's go ahead and configure our area 0 interface so we're going to do network 192.168.10.0 and we need to remember here that this is a slash 30, right? So the wildcard mask would be 0.0.0.3 and this interface is going to be participating in area 0. So now you'll remember from the reading that we have to have area 0 and the text specifically states uh, that you need to have area 0. And so that is true if, so area zero is a must have if you have other areas, right? So if I were to come over here and let's say we had area 51 and this was the only area that I was going to have and I had my routers in this area right and let's say they're connected up here you can have a single area that is not area zero right so there's nothing preventing me from setting my network up to where I'm area 51 and this is going to work 
right? The reason the text states that you have to have area zero is because as soon as I were to, if I were to decide, hey, I want area 52, and I'm going to expand my network, and we've got three more routers over here, and we'll connect these guys up, and I want this router to be the interface, right? The area border router, so this would be considered our ABR, the area border router, then I want this router to interface with this area border router, which is in area 51. This is not going to function, right? So this is not going to work. So as long as you have only a single area, you can pick whichever area number you would like. And if I move back over here, whoops, pull back up this exercise. Where are we at here? If I move back here, you can see that the area ID is a 16-bit value, or I'm sorry, 32-bit value, that can be anywhere from 0 to 4.29 billion, right? So, and that's the same 32 bits that you construct an IP address with. However, remember, the area that we specify here can either be a decimal value or it can be in an IP address format. So if I were to say 0.0.0.0, .0 then that's the same thing as saying 0. However, if I were to say 1.1.1.1, that is not the same thing as saying 1,111, right? So you would have to convert that IP address from its dotted decimal notation, you would have to convert that uh, into binary and then to get your decimal, right? So you would have to figure out what that would equal as a decimal number. So remember that this area number is not an IP address, even though you can represent it in IP address format. And so you can see there's, we could have 4.29 billion areas, which would be an awfully large network, probably not what you're gonna be using. So we're gonna go ahead and stick with area zero, right? And that's the area that we would end up using. So the ABR, right, connects and communicates with another ABR in another area, or you could have, you know, there could be one big router sitting here that has an interface in area 52 and also has an, air, an interface in area 51. However, that is not going to work. So if you have more than one area, you must have area zero, right? And this is also referred to as your backbone area, okay? So at this point, you could then have a router here, right? That's part of area zero. It could be part of area 51. And we could have another router here that also has an interface. And we can say that this is area 63 right so and in this case this setup will function right up here with no area zero so if we have no area zero and we grow to beyond one area that will not work right okay so let me go ahead and pull this back up let's do control p i'm going to clear that out and let's get router one back up here all right so we're going to go ahead and say, let's back up. We've got router one. So we're going to put that interface in area zero. And we're probably not going to see an, an adjacency established yet because we've got some more work to do. We're going to have to configure routers two and three. So, but right now, let me save my configuration and let's do a show IP protocols. And let's see what we've got here. So we can see that the routing protocol is OSPF with a process ID of one. We don't have any filter lists, but here again, a key piece of information is our router ID. So the number of areas that this router sees is two. It sees area zero, and it also sees area one. Stub and NSSA are well beyond the um, scope of what we're talking about here for a CCNA level course. Um, the max path, again, also outside the scope of the course. So routing for networks. So here are the networks that we're routing for. And these are the network statements that we put in. It also shows the area. And then if you come down here, 
routing information sources, right? So this is interesting. So <clears throat> it shows that the router ID for the routers where we're learning information, we're learning from ourselves, 1111, from 5555, and from 9999. The distance is our administrative distance, which is 110, and that's for OSPF. All right, if I do a show IP route, you can see that I've got some directly connected networks, uh, 10110, uh, 10120, and 192.168.10. And so the 192.168.10 is also directly connected. If we do the show IP OSPF database, and this is going to be some interesting output here, so we can see that we've got for the router with the router ID of 1111, that's us. You can see we have router link states, so this is an LSA type one. We've also got summary network link states for area zero, right? For 10110 and 10120. And then we've got router link states, and I'm sorry, summary ne network link states, LSA type three. And so then here for the router link states for area one, so every router in an area is going to generate a, a LSA type one to identify itself and to describe the information about what it sees in its network, right? Then you have a network link state. This is a type two LSA, and we receive the network link states here for 9.9.9.9 and 5.5.5.5. Again, those are router IDs, right? The link ID, you can see here it shows you is 10.1.1.2 and 10.1.2.2. And that's the, link, uh, that's the link ID on which we're learning about these network link states. And then again, the summary link state for area one, right? We're advertising this LSA and this is a type three LSA. All right, so then we've got the um, show IP OSPF neighbors, right? So you can see that we've established a relationship with 5555 and 9999, and that both of those routers on each of their respective links, those are seen as the designated router for those links. And so again, remember that the highest router, highest router OSPF priority, we didn't set one, so by default that value is one, right? So that's the first criteria to select the DR. The second criteria is the highest router ID, which would be that 9999 or the 5555. So if they don't have their uh, OSPF uh, router priority set, they would also become the designated routers when negotiating with or when the election takes place place with us and then the highest loopback address would be the third criteria then followed by the highest numbered physical interface or the highest IP address on a physical interface okay and so then uh, let's do a show IP OSPF interface whoops show IP OSPF interface and this is going to give us information such as the timer values, the hello timer, the dead timer, the wait timer. It shows us that this is a the serial interface 000 that we have that goes into area 0 is a slash 30. It shows us what our router ID is and it gives us the network type which is point to point and it also shows us the cost of that link which is 64 which is standard for a serial link. Let's see, what other information do we have in here that's of interest? So we can see that on the GIG01 interface that the designated router is 5555 and that that interface address that we're learning about 5555 is on the 10122. So that's their interface. Or wait, let me double check that really quick. Yeah, that's correct. The 10122 is going to be out on it's going to be their interface and then it shows us the backup designated router so we are the backup designated router right and it's on this interface the 10121 and that's our interface to the router with the router ID of 5555 
Okay, so that's router two. Let's, or I'm sorry, router one. Let's go ahead and jump into router two and knock out our configuration here. So we've got three interfaces. Um, all three interfaces for router two are going to be in area zero. So we're going to go from user exec to privilege exec. I'm going to type show IP interface brief. And this is going to show us the networks we're working with. So it's a 10.1, I'm sorry, 10.2. 1.0 slash 24. We've got 192.168.10.0 slash 30 and then .10.5 slash 30. So let's go ahead and set up our OSPF. Let's go into global config and we're going to type router OSPF 1 and I'm going to go ahead and type in network 10.1. I'm sorry, 10.2.1.0 and this is a slash 24 and that interface will be in area zero. And we should see an adjacency established with the cloud that exists up there that says area zero right underneath it. And let's go ahead and add in the other interfaces. So network 192.168, and there you go. So we've established an adjacency with the neighbor who's at router ID 4.4.4.4. So, and let me actually pull this back here. So we're gonna go, uh, apologize we're gonna go network 192.168.10 and so we've got two slash 30 so we'll do 10.0 first and so if it's a slash 30 the wildcard mask will be 0.0.0.3 and this interface is also in area 0 followed by 10.10.10.4 slash 30 which is going to be in area 0 as well and so we should also see an adjacency established here And we'll give it a second. I'm waiting for the timers. Or actually, I apologize, it won't. I was making the assumption that uh, this was all part of the cloud. So this is the router 3 interface. So we're going to have to jump onto router 3. So for router 2, if I do a do show IP interface brief, right here are the interfaces. I can do a do show IP OSPF neighbors. And that's going to show me my neighbors. So as you can see here, with this interface, right, this is a broadcast type interface, so it's going to be a designated router election will take place. However, on the serial interface, it is a, uh, a non-broadcast interface, right? So we're, what we're going to have here is when we take a look, we'll do the show IP uh, OSPF uh, interface, and we'll see the interface type, and that this interface type is not going to elect a, a DR. So if I were to do a do show IP OSPF interface and we want to take a look at the interface let's cruise back up here so serial 000 so here is the serial 000 interface and if I hit enter a couple times take us down you can see that it's up the line protocol is up so the network type is point to point right so point-to-point -point interface will not have that the DR BDR election take place. And so this is the serial interface that comes over here to router one. So on router one, if I were to do a show IP, oops, do a, a show IP OSPF interface, and we were to take a look at the serial interface, which is the 192 address. Did we go by it here? Let's see. Oh, the very first one, right? So you can see that it's point to point. And if I do a do show IP OSPF neighbors, I'm sorry, show IP OSPF neighbors, you can see that on that point to point interface, right, that a DRB BDR election does not take place. Okay. Um, let's go ahead and jump onto router three and wrap up our configuration tasks here. So I'm going to go ahead and type EN, enable, to get from user exec to privilege exec. We're going to go ahead and type config T to get into global config mode. And then into the OSPF router configuration mode, we'll type OSPF, or router OSPF1. And let's go ahead and configure, I'm going to have to bring this guy down just a little bit here. So there's our networks. So we'll say network, or actually, 
to get the router ID. So 3.3.3.3, and let me cruise back to router 2 here real quick and make sure that we get that set. Uh, router ID 2.2.2.2, okay, there we go. So we're gonna go ahead and do a uh, do clear IP OSPF proc for clearing the process out. It's gonna restart it, and we'll come back to router 3 where we did set the router ID. So then we've got uh, network, uh, it's going to be 192.168.10.4 and then with a wildcard mask of 0.0.0.3 .0 because again that's a slash 30 and that interface is in area 0. So that's our interface into the backbone area. Uh, the next thing we're going to type is network 192.168.2.0 and this is a slash 24 and this is an area three, I just, let me move this down real quick, yeah, oh, area two, apologize, into area two, and then again, we're going to do 192.168.1.0, which is also going to exist in area two, and so we should see here shortly, and there they are, on the gig zero zero and zero one interfaces, which go out to the cloud, which is in the purple area, that we have everything out there, and that the adjacency has been established and so here on router 3 let's go ahead and we'll save our config real quick and I'll do a show IP protocols right and you're gonna see some additional information here there's quite a few networks that we're learning information from right so there's the router ID for router 3 and again, the uh, the maximum paths is outside of the the scope. But what this I actually tell you what it stands for. So uh, maximum path simply means the number of paths over which you could um, do what's called ECMP or equal cost multipathing, right? So it's like like uh, the concept if you think of it, sort of like maybe an Ether channel, right? Where you can have multiple links with inside an Ether channel and the traffic would theoretically load share across those links. It's the same thing here as what we're saying is you can have a maximum of four paths across which you can do equal cost multipathing. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, so now we've got the routing information sources. So as you can see here, there are quite a few sources that we've learned from here on Router 3. We've learned about 1111, 2222, 3333-4444-6666. So we are learning about quite a few networks, right? So if I were to do show IP route, you can see here that we are learning about an OSPF route that is an inter area route. So that's what the IA stands for. If I scroll up a little bit, so it's inter area right and that is different from intra area and it's interesting here they say uh, OSPF for the O so when you see an O that means that this route has been learned from OSPF but the way that you would refer to that is you would say that's an intra area route because it's within the same area as opposed to an inter area route which is a route that you are learning, or I apologize. So here's the uh, the intro, sorry, I had that highlighted by mistake. One of the O and got the uh, the rest of the IP. So the 192.168.1, right? So it's this address here. We are directly connected here. So we're going to see that, or I apologize, this is, got it backwards here. Yeah, so, on the area zero interface, the 10 to one, which is here, this is, we are in this area, right? So let's go back, let's reset here. So this O represents an intra area route and it's an intra area route because router three is learning about this network, the 10 to one zero and router three is participating in area zero, right? So that is an intra, intra area route. When you see the O with the IA, that is specifying that this is an intra area, or I'm sorry, inter area route, right? And what that means is it's coming from another area. 
And so 10111 and 10120, you can see are coming over here from area one is how we're learning about those. So those would be considered inter-area routes, not intra-area routes. So let's go down and take another look here. So here's an intra-area route, right? Because we're learning about this and we are directly participating in this area, area two. So let's jump over to area one real quick. And if I do a show IP um, OSPF, um, let's do show IP route actually. So if I do a show IP route, we take a look at the routes here and you can see that there are two inter area routes, right? So these are coming from another area and that's what the IA stands for. So 192.168.1.0, Remember, these are coming from area two. Router one does not have an interface that is participating in area two. Therefore, when it learns about the routes, because the routes are gonna be originated here in area zero, you're gonna be, they're gonna be learned about here and then router one will learn about them because it has an interface participating in area zero. It sees those as inter area routes because they are coming from another area in which router one is not participating. Okay, and here is the intra area routes which is a route that is being learned from the OSPF process in which router one has an interface that is participating in that area and in this case it is area one, right? And then you have area zero. So 10210 is this network right here. Router one has an interface that is participating in this area. Therefore, it is going to learn that route as an intra area route. And I apologize there at the beginning, I was off on, off on the output. Okay, all right. So this has been the configuration of multi-area OSPF, right? We took a look at some of the different LSA types type one, type two, type three. Um, we also looked at how to configure multi-area OSPF with the network statements. We talked about the difference between the inter-area routes and the intra-area routes. Keeping in mind that the intra-area routes are going to be learned on interfaces where the router that we're looking at the routes on has an interface participating in that area. That is an intra-area route. Learning about routes from other areas, those are considered OSPF IA routes, which are inter-area routes. Okay, so that wraps up Packet Tracer Activity 6.2.3.6, and I hope this cleared up uh, any confusion you had and maybe filled in some gaps on multi-area OSPF. All right, have a great day and see you later this week.